Growing Together, a gardening podcast, is sponsored by Bloomfield Garden Center, a family-owned retail greenhouse providing locally grown plants since 1974. You can find them one mile north of Sabin, Minnesota, or six miles south of I-94 at exit 6. Just a quick drive from Fargo-Moorhead. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Growing Together, a gardening podcast with me, John Lamb, and Don Kinsler, a lifelong gardener and the North Dakota State University Extension horticulturist for Cass County. Don, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I always enjoy our weekly chats. Well, and it's we had to take a little bit of time off because we had the 4th of July and we both had other things planned. Did you have a good 4th? Oh, I had a great 4th. And you know what my ideal weekend or 4th of July long weekend? Well, we did go to Duluth. That's amazing. Always lovely. But I love spending as much time in our yard and garden flower yeah. beds. You know, it's not just a line of work for me. It's, man, I love it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> we've, so I'm happy to be uh, doing a line of work that is also a, a wonderful pastime. And we've had great weather the last we two have. weeks. I know that people Things may be listening to this at any time. but Could use a little rain. Yeah, in, in early July, we've had very kind of actually mild weather. And we have. You know, I'm hoping right now as we're recording this that we'd get an inch of rain. Our lawns and everything else could really use it. Well, before we get too far, we want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by Bloomfield Garden Center, a family-owned greenhouse providing locally grown plants since 1974. And you can find them one mile south of Sabin, Minnesota, or six miles south of of, of I-94 off exit 6. Just a quick drive from Fargo-Moorhead. Well, Don, I know we normally kick off the show with a joke, and I was going to tell a lawn joke, but I decided to weed it out. (laughs) <laughs> and grass jokes are always green, yes. I just uh, one. <laughs> well, so you work those jokes I in. Did, you know, I did, I interesting with the weekly garden column in the forum newspapers. I always enjoy starting with a little bit of humor, you know, because – uh, the yards, gardens, the whole gardening thing is it, – it's fun and not just fun. It's so wholesome and yeah, it's its kind of light. It gives such a re- reprieve from some of the heavier things in life. And yeah. so so humor, a little bit of humor and gardening go hand in hand. And exactly. And that's where I got the whole – thing from is I love the fact that you start off the columns with a joke, so I thought we should start the, the show off with a joke, and we will be talking about lawns, because here we are in the middle of in the middle of summer, uh, b- people have lots of questions about lawns, but before we get into that, I wanted to talk to you about a recent experience you had. You went out to the Red River Valley Fair, and you were a judge, and want to hear what you were judging and what your experience was like. Yeah, well, I've been happy to be a judge at the Red River Valley Fair for the last 44 years. Okay. Yeah, so it's been fun since about 1979. And so I judge two two entities or two aspects out of the Red River Valley Fair. I judge the horticulture exhibits in the open class. That's the the adult and uh, there's a youth division also. But then I also judge the 4-H, you know, mem- uh, kids that are members of the Cass County 4-H clubs. And so I judge both of those separately. But I, oh, and it's it's awesome to see what people grow and bring on in. And I really want to encourage gardeners To consider next year, like at the Red River Valley Fair, the open class where just everyone, any of us, can enter. And, of course, if you request online uh, Red River Valley Fair, the fair booklet, it tells you all these categories. It tells you to... Uh, if you want to display beets, you know, bring in six or, you know, apples, five apples or whatever it is. They tell you what you need to bring in and all these different classes. So it is awesome to see what people will grow, flowers, vegetables, uh, fruit, uh, rhubarb. Uh, there are some awesome displays of rhubarb. And so if you're kind of thinking about that, you know, you don't have to be some sort of heavy-duty, intense gardener to, to you know, this. it's not that you have to be in a certain class of gardener to exhibit in that. No, it's for all of us. And isn't it fun to, to uh, have a blue ribbon winner? You yeah. know, maybe your tomatoes, they're, they're still green this time of year, but if they're fairly good size or some apples that are developing, uh, the onions – that I judged won the grand champion. They were nice for this size of year, a nice plate of onions. And when you're considering uh, entering things, a couple of tips. One is the 
produce should be clean, uh, wash, you know, if you dig carrots to exhibit them, uh, wash the excess dirt off uh, and uh, display as many uniform uh, samples as you can. For example, if the if it calls for six radishes, try to get the six radishes that look like peas in a pod because uh, they all judge on uniformity and nice size, good quality, you know, free of insect damage. So anyway, uh, exhibiting like that was probably a more of a popular thing in the past, I suppose, uh, but I, I really want it to become an increasing thing for us because I just think it's kind of fun to uh, for us everyday people to uh, win a blue ribbon on something well, or red. And I was wondering about that because I'm glad we're talking about this because I was thinking like, well, you know, the fair is usually I think it's either the second weekend of July, but it's after the fourth, but before the middle of the month, really. And right. It's ten Runs days. For about ten days. It's yep. ten days. Um, but so it's before a lot, kind of like the the peak produce season you know a lot of things aren't quite in yet you know like you think of the fair and you think of like the huge melons or something like that right um so but it's like with tomatoes are people bringing in their whole plants then or are they uh, how, how do they how do you judge those the tomato fruit okay uh for example there is a class since there probably aren't going to be ripe tomatoes in right. the first part of July, but there is a category for green tomatoes. Okay. So there was a plate of nice green. There was only one entry in that, but yep. that's okay. Uh, and I judge each kind of individually. It doesn't mean just because you bring in a plate and it's the only exhibit, you're going to be the winner, but each is judged kind of on its merit in a way. So anyway, a plate of green tomatoes that were really nice and big for, for this time of year and that were nice quality, free of blemish. And so, yeah, you kind of judge the things uh, based on the time of year. If at this time of year, that's really, really good, such as onions. You know, they aren't as big in early July as they're going to be at the end of the season, but you judge them at that. And so it, it's fun. You know, just kind of a, you know, the county fair, there's something wholesome about yeah. that. And exhibiting, whether it's uh, kids in 4-H or the open class, it's, it's fun. It's just something something intriguing, enticing. So, And you share it. It shows what we can grow in this area. Do you judge other fairs or has it just been the Red River Valley Fair? It's been fair? the Red River Valley okay. Fair. Yeah, and if you've ever listened uh, to, to me, uh, any programming or uh, read some of my hearing, if you notice, I never refer to our climate as challenging or difficult or anything like that. No, gosh, we can grow all kinds of good things. And the fair is a good example when you see all of these things. There were, I think we had, gosh, I bet six beautiful plates of rhubarb. I was going to say, you got really excited classic. talking about the rhubarb. <laughs> what made these rhubarbs uh, oh, so... Oh, it was so nice and red. Okay. Nice, the good red variety and such nice uniform stocks. And, you know, rhubarb is, you know, it's been around since pioneer days in our area. So, so do they bring in it's with the classic. leaves too, or do they just trim the tops? Oh, well, it's interesting. So if you read the fair booklet, okay. uh, of course, I say uniformity is important. So, and of course, when you harvest rhubarb, you pull it, don't yep. you? You pull it, and which leaves a little bit of the end stub on. Mm -hmm. And then also the the way to exhibit rhubarb is you, you don't bring the leaves in w with the stalk, but you cut it so there's a little bit of a remnant of the leaf up at the top. Uh -huh. Because, for example, uniformity is a key. So if you can find six stalks of rhubarb that look like peas in a pod, uh, that will place fairly high. But if you could cut them, uh, of course, you know, any of us could cut six stalks of rhubarb and make them all totally even. But if you have to leave a little bit of that leaf on up at the top and you've got the base stub, I can see – that you pulled six very uniform stalks, all the same size. All right. Well, we could do a whole show on rhubarb someday. <laughs> well, we should. We should. I mean, I guess it's we're- It's a classic. As, as the kind of the the saying, well, not the saying, but you know, the the conventional wisdom is that, you know, by by this time, by early July, you should be kind of done, for the most part, harvesting right? Yeah, exactly. Rhubarb. To give the rhubarb a chance to recover for the last half of the season. Yeah, you could say we could still pull a stalk or two. Ex you know. Exactly. Yeah, but the, the heavy harvest uh, 4th of July is about done. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe next uh, mid-June we should do a whole show on rhubarb. Yeah. I've good. got a good joke on, about rhubarb, but we're going to save <laughs> yes. that for— Yes, Well— no, let's, save, let's save it. Let's save it. That's good. Should we save it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Let's save good. it. Give you a reason to listen again next June. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> well, hopefully you'll be here. So <laughs> I will. <laughs> well, let's take a quick little break and we come back. We're going to talk about probably the most, I would imagine, the topic that you're asked most about besides tomatoes, and that's the lawn. The lawn. So we're going to talk about the lawn and kind of the past, the present, and the future of of landscape. It's an interesting history. Yep. And uh, interesting future possibilities. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick little break and we come back. We're going to talk lawns. Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit inforum.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. Okay, so what what would you say is the, what what do you get more questions about, lawns or tomatoes? Lawns. Lawns. Everyone's got a, well, I shouldn't say everyone. Man, it's a good, but yeah, but, but people who have lawns, it's, 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 it's right out front. It's the thing that people see. And every time you, if you have a house or you are renting a house or, or a, a, a condo or a twin home, something like that, when you go out in your yard, that's the first thing you see. It is. But in, in many ways, the lawn is the canvas on which the rest of your landscape rests. Yep. yep. And so in many cases, yeah, it depends on that lawn. It'll be fun here as we examine some of the the history and the future of the lawns. Well, now you have kind of, you've posed a question, so I will I will give it back to you, but are lawns becoming a thing of the past? Well, that, that is a wonderful, wonderful situation to ponder. And so we'll talk about the history, but also there's a trend, and I'm sure you've noticed too, because it's all over social media and all over everywhere, that there are trends away from Mm -hmm. the historic green lawn. Yep. And so it's kind of fun to ponder, and it would be fun to be able to look into the future a little bit to see what it's going to hold. Yeah. Well, so let's talk a little bit about the history of lawns. How how did lawns come come to be? And when did we get to this point? We as as people, civilization, that we decided all this grass around us, we need to have it cut short. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fun to. So if you do a little online searching the history of lawns, here here's what you come up with. Well, it appears that lawns were first trimmed or grass was first trimmed around medieval castles because you could not have marauders coming up, creeping through tall grass, uh, you know, kind of in the dark of night or whenever to get to your castle. So they started cutting the grass and keeping things clear cut around the castle so they could see people coming up. So like a defense mechanism. Uh, Exactly. And so sometimes they'd have livestock grazing it. Sometimes they'd cut it by hand. But basically, you don't want a whole lot of landscape or tall grass growing around your castle. So that's where it started. And then from there, in old Europe, the large uh, chateaus, uh, it became a thing of prestige. If you had a beautiful grass that was cut and mowed, you know, if you think of the palace at Versailles, uh, Buckingham Palace, uh, the beautiful gardens, but they also have very beautiful lawns. And so it kind of morphed from a defense mechanism to a thing of beauty and graciousness. If you, if you could afford it, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you were in the upper class if yeah. you could afford to have a beautiful lawn like that. And that transmitted also to North America when the settlers came from uh, Europe to, to America a couple of things happened, such as in the New England area where they had kind of commons, a common area. Sometimes the cattle were allowed to graze out in the common area, and uh, those would keep the grass shorter. So that also, you know, a double purpose thing, feed the cattle and uh, keep the lawn looking kind of pleasant. But in the south especially with the large plantations – Uh, Of course, slaves ended up doing the majority of this, but uh, they would keep these beautiful, well-manicured lawns in front of the plantations. And so that also became the the, the thing kind of of prestige. If you could afford to have a well-manicured lawn, you know, it, uh, it just blended well with the whole surroundings. And so it's interesting, the kind of one area of the country versus the other. And then... Here, here is the single most important thing that allowed lawns to be for us commoners, the invention of the lawnmower. So when was that? In the late 1800s, 
and I don't know who the developer was that got the patent on it, but uh, uh, the same, a similar lawnmower to what we had when I was a boy before we got the powered lawnmower, um, a real type lawnmower. Have you ever used one of those, John? The yes. ones that you push along and it goes click, click, it's click, click. It's a cylinder of, yeah. of, of yeah. How do you spinning blades. That? Yeah. yeah. And some two wheels, they're kind of front loaded almost. And then there's a back roller usually. Exactly. And you push it and your handle, the hand, ours at least, the handle would go up so you could kind of spin it or you know hang it, I suppose, in a garage. They're heavy. Right, they're heavy, and yeah, the blades, these blades that would ro ro rotate, kind of rotate yep. around, and they actually kind of cut the grass. You know, our modern lawnmowers where the blade spins, they kind of spin off that, uh, cut it by kind of a spinning. But those uh, real type mowers actually do give a almost like a scissors type cut as that blade cuts the grass. So for some of the finest, maybe you've even noticed in some of the some. Uh, golf courses will use those. You know, a gang. Uh, the mower has a gang of all these smaller, real mowers that go over. That gives a very nice cut as long as they keep sharp. But uh, those mowers, as I remember, you know, if you hit a weed that oh, had a little bit, of, if you had yeah. a yard with oak trees and you had oh, twigs that fell, twigs that, yeah. or he had an acorn that spun around, yeah. and, but yeah. they're they're kind of fun in a way, yeah. in kind of a nostalgic type way. They're quiet. I kind of miss is that. The thing yeah, that I, I kind of miss that. Like Quiet, too. click, 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 click. As I think it people go. like it because they're, they're, they were quiet. People have yeah. started using them now again. And I think because they're quieter and they, they're not gas. Yeah. And so for, for small um, lawns. Yeah. You really kind don't of need perfect. It. So it's kind of fun to see those on the market again. And I kind of like to push one just for old time's sake. But anyway, when that mower was invented, all of a sudden, us run of the mill everyday people, could afford a lawnmower and afford to keep our lawns cut. Yeah. And so that was uh, late 1800s or so. And so things go along in the 1920s, 1930s. And then after World War II, we, uh, we got into the area late 40s, early 50s. I call it the leave it to beaver era. You know, if you kind of picture their home, um, and even some of the ads, you have these wonderful, neat little homes, uh, maybe a hedge around out front, neatly trimmed, and the lawn, beautiful, and, and maybe the uh, an elderly gentleman with a pipe uh, in his mouth, and he's, you know, rolling along his push lawnmower. Very idyllic, you know, exactly. very idyllic neighborhood. There's mm -hmm. the... There's oddly no trees in the yards. But. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. Everything looks picture perfect. And the sun is always out. And exactly. And so anyway, um, those, that really ushered in kind of the suburban type lawn. And, and now it's interesting. In those lawns in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, clover in that lawn was considered – Elite. You had a wonderful thing if you had clover in that lawn too. The little white Dutch clover uh, that it mows beautifully. The reason that was considered elite and put in grass mixes because it it plays well with lawn grass, it kind of blends on in, and it provides nutrients. Uh, it's a legume that fixes nitrogen down into the soil, and so it's interesting. It was. Kind of considered elite if you had that. I remember as a young boy, we had clover in a lot. It was kind of fun to see if you could find a four-leaf clover. Oh, yeah. I, yep. I never did, but I looked. Uh, and then at a certain point after World War II and the 1950s, you know, 2,4-D and lawn weed herbicides or herbicides that would separate out broad leaves from grasses uh, that could be applied to lawns. And so this uh, – Okay, the Leave It to Beaver area maybe looked like it was weed-free, uh, but uh, maybe it wasn't always, but it just looked like that in pictures and on TV. But anyway, um, when the uh, advent of the herbicides came on, then all of a sudden um, clover started being injured by those products. So you saw less clover, and all of a sudden these uh, – the totally pure Kentucky bluegrass lawns without a – uh, without anything else in them, kind of became the 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 fashion the, yeah. in vogue, and um, yeah, so things have kind of changed. But that's kind of a little bit of a look at the history, and of course that brings us to today. And uh, so it's kind of a, fun to examine where we are today with our lawns and where we are going into the future. 
Well, before we get too far, like what are they? Let's talk about the advantages of a lawn. Like why why a lawn at all? We've talked about all these you know these developments that we need, and let's say we don't have livestock, we don't have to worry about marauders really anymore. But so why why do we? What are the advantages to a lawn? Yeah, you know, there are some very distinct advantages to a lawn, and one of those is that the lawn grass, uh, well, it cools the area. There's been some research that I think it uh, reduces the temperature in the vicinity of the lawn by I think it's uh, seven to seventeen degrees. So it has a cooling effect on the surroundings, so it can cut down on air conditioning needs. Also, a a square area, it's only several feet by several feet, produces of lawn produces enough oxygen for an adult for a day. So it's giving us oxygen. And it also filters dust out of the air It uh, when it's doing its photosynthesis thing. And just think all those little grass plants doing their photosynthesis thing. They uh, remove impurities out of the air. And as rainfall comes down and, and runs across concrete and things like that, lawn can fill in. Uh, when rain comes down off our roof and you know impurities and all that, as it, as that water runs across lawn grass, the lawn is filtering it, so it doesn't all end up going down the drain and into our rivers and streams. So lawns are a fairly effective, uh, fairly effective filtering mechanism, and so you know there are other good uh, good things too that lawns do. So th- they they aren't a total suck of resources. Right, they return back to us. Well, you know, and gosh. Uh, who of us, when we were kids, didn't enjoy running across the lawn uh, with our bare feet? You know, so they make a good playground. They withstand traffic. There are other some alternatives that we'll talk about later that don't withstand foot traffic. But lawns, you can play on it good, and it withstands. So some really good reasons why the lawn became so popular as we know it. Well, and also that, that once you get the lawn established, and we could talk a little bit about seeding lawn or how to how to get a lawn started, but well, they're relatively easy for maintenance, right? right. And yeah, that's the other good things about a lawn is they're kind of easy to establish. When Mary and I moved to our current location, uh, it was all black dirt because we had moved the house on in. We seeded the entire area ourselves, uh, kept it well watered. It established fine. So you don't need uh, really fancy equipment to make lawn seeding work. And uh, also the maintenance is fairly easy. You can you know, mow it. Uh, and also, a lawn can be whatever level of maintenance you want it to be. You know, it can be a high maintenance where you're fertilizing twice a year, maybe four times a year, applying herbicides. But it can also be fairly maintenance-free. You can opt for a lawn that that doesn't need regular watering. Maybe it'll go dormant in the summer, but it comes out of that. And so it can be a low-maintenance lawn, too. So you don't have to pour a lot of resources into it. I don't pour a lot of resources into our lawn. I want it to be nice. And so I fertilize it at least once a year. But it can be relatively low maintenance. And, um, yeah, so the care of them can be less than some of the alternatives. Well, I'm curious to hear about what, how you installed your lawn. And let's talk a little bit about how, how people – sure. the different ways that you can start a lawn. When you and Mary did your lawn, did you just have like – the standard, the uh, what do you call it? The the Scotts yeah, the radiator Scots or push, not, uh, push. Yeah, a drop yeah. seeder. Drop seeder. Drop seed. Yeah, and it doubles as either a fertilizer spreader or a seeder. Yep. And the directions tell you on the dial where to set it for seeding. And yeah, so we the soil was I had rotor tilled it up uh, and then just used one of those, pushed it along, dropped the seed, kept it well watered, and grass grew. Did you – and you probably didn't – for an area probably that big, you probably didn't like – I know some people will cover there with burlap or something like that to to kind of keep help keep it moist and then also maybe keep some of the birds away from taking seeds. Right, because that um, – keeping that surface uniformly moist until the grass uh, sprouts is very, very important. So in the backyard, we spread straw. And of course, straw and wind don't mix well. (laughs) So as I was spreading the straw, and you only want a thin layer, as I was spreading it, Mary was following behind with the hose to wet it down good so that the straw wouldn't all end up over in the neighbors. And uh, so the front yard, we opted just to keep it wet. And that worked well, too. Uh, In one portion of it, we did get some of the – you can buy bags of mulch, kind of a greenish mulch that you spread out, and that works beautifully, too. So we did that in a corner. So each of those worked well. 
And some people will just start from sod, which will be a little bit yes. more of an investment. But now there's there, uh, a good discussion too can be seeded lawn versus sodded lawn. Again, a sodded lawn gives you that grass right away. Yeah. You know, it's dirt now and an hour later you can have a beautiful lawn. Yeah. And um, the advantage of seeding is that that seed roots down into the current soil. So it establishes its roots down in. Sod can sometimes remain in a layer on top of our heavy clay soil. And so sod can sometimes have a difficulty penetrating down in. But if moisture and nutrients are good, sod can work too. When we had a garden center, we did both. We provided sod and seeding. So we talked about the advantages of having a lawn. We talked that there's some work too. So what are the disadvantages yeah, of having a lawn? We've got to talk about the cons as well as the pros. And of course, the disadvantages are in order to keep a bluegrass lawn, which is a common grass in our area, Kentucky bluegrass, in order to keep that lush and green, it does require a fair amount of water. If we got an inch of rain every week, the lawn would stay perfectly green. But if you want it to be green throughout the summer, it does mean adding some water. Also, the more fertility it has, the greener and lusher it will be. So uh, adding fertilizer at least once a year, September is the, the ideal time around Labor Day, very important for fertilizing lawns. And so it does respond to fertilizing. So, uh, you know, that can be a little bit of a, a needed resource to be added to it. And of course, weed control, if you do no, no weed control on a lawn at all, some of the aggressive type things, you know, thistles, uh, creeping Charlie, some of those can take over lawn. So they can require um, management such as that. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to talk about some alter. We're going to talk about the future of lawns and we're going to talk about some alternatives. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick little break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about where we see our lawns going. If you're loving this podcast, be sure to check out our full lineup. From news and local politics to sports and true crime, find your next great listen right now at inforum.com slash podcasts. That's inforum.com slash podcasts. So as we promise this whole show, we're going to talk about the future of lawns and, and where we see some alternatives to There's a to lot of discussion grass. going on about that. It is a big topic now. Especially because we we are into our third kind of dry dryish year. And so in the middle of summers like these, our lawns are going kind of dormant. And if you want it to be really nice, then they require water. So there's a lot of discussion over the last couple of years, increasing discussion as to is there something we should be doing other than these lawns? Well, and I think there's 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 a lot of different factions to that too, which is that one is that for environmental things, for environmental issues, especially like pollinators, you know, do we want to have something that grass is nice, but could we do something more that was beneficial in that way to that would help the pollinators? Right. And, and of course, if we do something in the lawn that will help the pollinators, that helps our apple trees and our yep. cucumbers and our everything flowers. else that uh, that depends on these pollinators. So, what are some of the kind of the the ground cover alternatives that that people are talking about now? Because you know, all over social media, there is really a big push for deciding for something else. So, if we take a look, uh, there's a number of different ways that a person could go. Uh, bee lawns have become popular. So it's interesting. If you do a little online search for bee lawns, it's interesting. You know, you could start totally from scratch on a lawn, and but, but you can also incorporate some of these things into that. For example, we were talking, John, about a bee lawn mix that you had. Yep. And usually in addition to some grass types uh, that are lower maintenance, uh, they have uh, white clover, the white Dutch clover, which is low-growing clover that meshes really well with lawn grass, and creeping thyme. Creeping thyme is a little less winter-hardy than we would like, but it uh, kind of has a nice lavender, rosy-type flower. And then also a plant called self 
heal, self-heal. So those mixed in, they will create a lawn, a bee lawn that the pollinators love. I mean, the they're going to provide uh, blossoms kind of throughout from spring through summer and fall. They're going to provide blossoms for our little bees, especially the native bees, uh, to live and thrive and be able to pollinate our crops. So it's really a win-win. It gives the bees something and gives, uh, gives us food, actually. Yeah, we just we just put down in an area of our lawn that's separated by um, by a walkway. Uh, so we have a grass lawn on our backyard on one side, and this other area we were trying to figure out what to do, and we decided, well, let's let's try a clover lawn just in this area and see how it see how it works. And so I just actually uh, put down the seeds earlier this week. You know, it's been so kind of cool. I thought, well, yeah, maybe this is the yeah. best time to. To get it in now. Right. And things would stay a little more moist too yeah, and I, when you water. I covered it with burlap or, you know, with a burlap like thing. And uh, so, yeah, keeping it moist and keeping watered. So we'll see. It'll take a couple of weeks, obviously, to for the, the seeds to set in and germinate. But it, I'm curious to see. And I'm also curious to see how it does under the dogs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That'll be interesting as well. So un, one alternative is to use your existing lawn and incorporate these things in. There are directions if you take a look at to do a little online search for bee lawns, how to convert your existing lawn into a bee lawn. Uh, you don't need to totally turn it all black. You can do some seeding into the existing lawn or you can even use white Dutch clover. Uh, and uh, seed that into your lawn. Uh, the fall is a great time to do that as, as well. And um, so that's a really good alternative, the bee lawn. Or there's also a big movements to maybe um, redo your lawn totally and turn it into a native prairie. A native prairie. Uh, there's a gentleman up in Grand Forks that I wrote about uh, about a year, year and a half ago who had turned his Grand Forks front yard into a native prairie with native prairie wildflowers and grasses, and it's beautiful. That would be really – that's probably, again, a whole other show that we could do. But, the, yeah, uh, using native plants, and that would be really fun. Yeah, exactly. I, I should mention, too, that anytime we do something, whether it's a bee lawn or the native prairie – uh, none of these are totally carefree right? because, for example, the thistles and things like that that uh, the, we have to deal with in our current lawn grass, uh, we need to deal with those also even if you have a bee lawn or if you have a native prairie uh, lawn or a prairie planting. Uh, the thistles are probably going to find their way too as well as other weeds. So it's not as though those materials – will be totally carefree uh, either. We do need to uh, deal with weeds. For example, the gentleman up in Grand Forks that has such a, done such a beautiful job of um, the prairie-type wildflower and plantings, uh, he, with an eyedropper, uh, will go through and drop herbicide on the things like the thistles and the quack grass and other things so that are precision. sure to find their way. And, of course, the birds come through and drop this and that and the other th seed that comes along. And so there is maintenance on those, too. Uh, so none, none of this is maintenance-free, but that's okay. You know, the, the, sometimes the process of getting close to nature and working with these things, the process is fun, too. Yeah. So it's, you know, what, what fun would that be if we just sat back and watched everything grow? Well, you know, working with it, to me, is part of the fun. Yeah, you get to appreciate it. You get exactly. to you put your hands in there. What, one of the things I'm curious about is uh, creeping juniper. Yes. You know, if we took a look at other alternatives, okay, we talked about bee lawn, we talked about native prairie type grass, wildflower planting, uh, creeping juniper. If you've observed in your own landscape or somebody else, there are junipers that will stay only maybe two, three, four, six inches high and just spread outward. And they become massive. At the Horticulture Research Farm, uh, NDSU, Horticulture Research Farm, which is about 40 miles west of uh, Fargo, um, there is a planting of all types of shrubs and trees. And that's coming up in September too. We got to talk a tour about or? yeah the uh, field oh, day. Okay. We, we got to talk about that research farm. But anyway, Let's do that. at that research farm, which has been in place, uh, I actually did some of the initial plantings along with the the founder, Dr. Dale Herman. Uh, that would have been in the 
late 1970s. But anyway, the junipers, the creeping junipers, now are huge, massive, lawn-like. And you could do a little light walking. You can do a little light walking over them. But if you were in an area where you don't walk on the, the area, creeping junipers fill out quite nicely. Okay. You do need to, you know, they, they'll have some weeds that'll poke up too that you need to deal with. In addition to that, there are other ground covers that we could use. Um, ground covers such as a juga. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. A little low growing, beautiful blue flower. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are um, lamium, different ground covers. Now, most of those will not tolerate uh, foot traffic very much because it crushes the stems. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I was going to mention before we totally leave the bee lawn, uh, do you know that uh, Scott's has a clover lawn? Uh, they sell a bag of uh, called clover lawn. It, it's 100% clover. Okay. It's a – so – you know, you don't need to just have clover in your lawn. You can have clover be the lawn. Okay. And so you can even plant a lawn totally of clover. Uh, that will take some foot traffic. And so if you see uh, uh, Scott's brand, I suppose is the most popular national brand. We don't endorse uh, particular brands, but that's certainly the most common. Readily available. And, yeah. And so uh, so that's interesting too. So, okay, we took a look at their various ground covers. If you don't have a lot of traffic there, that can work too. You know, there's one... There's one, I don't know if you call it a ground cover, or do you call it a weed? Uh, it's Creeping Charlie. <laughs> creeping Charlie. Now, more often than not, I'm answering questions from people that say, how do I get Creeping Charlie out of my grasp? Get because it is so people. hard to kill. Yep. Now, Creeping Charlie, I have seen a lawn in Fargo here that kind of went the, if you can't beat it, join it yep. route. And they just let their front lawn be um, it's kind of an, over in the older part of town. They let their lawn be creeping Charlie, and it's low growing. It's green. It stays green. Doesn't require a whole lot of fertilizer or watering or yep. anything else. And there it is. Uh, so I think creeping Charlie. He was not think. I know creeping Charlie was introduced into this continent uh, with a purpose, probably as a vigorous ground cover, and that it is. And you can walk on it. I mean, yeah, it's, you can and it's, you can you walk could, on it. You yeah. could have it's very durable, as we know, because it's hard to kill. Right. But like you could have dogs running over it, and it'll be fine. You exactly. don't you don't have to worry about them ripping it up. It's so if you redo back. your mindset. Yeah. You know, Creeping Charlie could be, yeah, <laughs> in the well, right spot, could and be also, useful. Also, if you have a shady area, it'll do, it'll do well, well too. Shade. Yeah. A person would want to be cognizant of the neighbors and their attitude, you know, because Creeping Charlie doesn't necessarily stop at property boundaries. What about, uh, there was, I think I first heard the term, first saw it used maybe about 20 years ago, xeriscaping. Yes. Is, is that kind of because I was well, landscaping the, for dryness? Yeah. And that's that's what I was thinking. That's really more. We're not talking about anything green there. Maybe, well, maybe not much, but you're you really are talking about a real drier climate or a drought area kind of, right? I mean, so yes. do you see much I, of that I, up here? I, uh, there for a while, for a few years ago, like you mentioned, a few years ago, a person heard that more. Now, instead of kind of purposely planting things for dryness. Uh, now a person views it more like, okay, what are some things, maybe native plants, and that's why there's a push towards native plants, native uh, wildflowers, native grasses, that will be beautiful, but yet don't require so much water. So when I think of xeriscape and some of that movement, it was, okay, I, I may not have the total mental picture, but I see Lots of rock mulch, yes, with uh, maybe a, a desert type <laughs> yucca big in it or, here or, or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah, and so, um, and that's not totally the picture of Xeriscape. But now the idea is maybe use some of the native things that were more adapted to the rainfall that we usually get, and that will stay beautiful uh, and give us color, give us greenery, but they don't require as much water as the typical lawn grass would. What are, what are some wildflowers and prairie grasses? Just We talked a little bit about this, but like if you wanted to get started, what, what are some ones that would be kind of readily available that you could set up an area? One of the wonderful ways to search would be uh, do, do an online search for 
Uh, sources of native grasses. There are some wonderful companies locally in uh, Minnesota, I believe some in North Dakota, that supply these wildflowers. In fact, um, Mary Holm, who, who from Prairie mm-hmm. Yard and Garden a Recently series, a guest, that yeah. was a recent guest, she works part-time at one of those uh, native plant uh, sellers. And so if we take a look at uh, – and th- those um, those online sources of those materials have wonderful catalog lists that will list all the different plants. Um, one, I believe, is Prairie Restorations. And have you heard of that, John? Prairie Rest- Restorations names, yeah. Company. And so when I'm looking for some recommendations as plants that w- would maybe do well, wildflowers or native grasses, I uh, search for those – sources of those and then you c- come up with a few different companies that and their catalog lists all these wonderful things now i'm you you've also included sedges we've got a couple of small sedges in our garden beds uh but you're talking about doing a, a there is a whole sedge the lawn whole, or, or yeah, a big portion sedge lawn and, and so talk a little bit a about sedge sedges is kind of a little kind of a tufty yep. type plant uh, it doesn't really spread outward like lawn grass, so you need to plant it maybe a little closer because it forms a nice clump. So that has been viewed as one thing that maybe is a lawn alternative. It doesn't really require mowing. Uh, how is this? How have the sedges done for you? It took. We had one that's not doing as well, and it's been about three years. And the other one is doing well, and I think it's rather it's because other things have grown around it and maybe shaded it a little. Sure. So. Generally, the sedges, in my experience, uh, haven't been quite as winter hardy, maybe that as we would it. like. Yeah, yeah. And but now here's an interesting concept. Uh, University of Minnesota has done a lot of trial on no mow grasses. Okay. Yeah. What about a grass that just didn't need to be mowed? Yeah. Uh, or low mow. Low mow means uh, it doesn't mean the mowing height is low, but low mow means you don't have to mow it as often. And so these grasses that kind of reach a height. And sometimes you see ads for these. I've seen ads for these. Uh, the certain grass that never needs mowing, and but they they reach a certain height and then just kind of stop there. But they look, in my opinion, they look a little floppy. Okay. Um, you know, they reach maybe six inches or so and don't stand erect. But they kind of uh, once they get that point, they kind of bend over and hang over. Uh, to me, it looks a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit like it needs mowing. Okay. Um, but. But that's how we need to adjust our mindset. I need to adjust my mindset. And if I planted a, a no-mow grass, even if it bends over, if I kind of realize that, okay, that's the way it's supposed to look. It's yeah. not supposed to look like a well-cut lawn grass. And so that's another thing that could be investigated too, would be a grass species that doesn't require as much input. Um, there's also another interesting grass that I am going to try – There are, it's tall fescue. Okay. In, and as soon as I describe this, uh, it may ring a few bells for us. Oftentimes in a person's lawn, you see a clump of very dark green grass. And it can be a contaminant in other grass seed mixes. But it's called tall fescue. It's not quack grass that spreads, you know, kind of hit and miss running through the lawn. But this stays in a clump. The clump will slowly expand. And even in the driest of midsummer, it will be green because it has such a deep root. And it's a little wider blade. That's why most people, when they send me an email, say, how do I get rid of this? Because the rest of my lawn grass looks like this, and this looks kind of out of place. But in the if you can't beat it, join it, because it stays so green and has such a deep root system that can pump water up, they've developed turf-type tall fescues. Okay. So uh, from seed companies, you can get this turf type tall fescue, which stays greener with less water. So if a person still wants the lawn look, uh, the look of kind of the customary mowed lawn, uh, this was one that would take less water, less fertility, less inputs uh, than some of the others. So I'm digressing a little bit when I talk about uh, – the no mow or low mow lawns. So that's one that I often, I, I'd like to try it myself because I haven't tried the tall fescue. But I'm kind of curious. If, if I had something that would stay really nice and green, 
without me having to water, which I, I don't water our lawn usually. Well, we've talked a lot about lawns and we're, this is the time of year we want to get out and experience our lawns and be outside. But And I'm fascinated to see what is the future going to hold for these lawns? You yes. Know, fast forward 10, 20 years. There, there's there's yeah, some things we, that we, we probably be, haven't even yeah, talked about. Exactly. I have a feeling there's going to be some changes, especially if moisture starts to be less abundant. Well, in the immediate future, the thing we have to deal with now are insects. And they are out. They are out in force. So let's talk a little bit about just for just to get this out there. We want to get ahead of this and help people out. What are some of the things that people should insect control products people should should have on hand? There are a few insect products that that I think all of us gardeners want to keep at ready, ready avail to have on our garden shelf so that when you see something, you've got these products. And there's not a big wide list of 20 choices. So in most cases, um, for us to keep on hand, because they're so they're, they're uh, effective against many different insects on flowers and vegetables, of course, always check the label. But uh, the Insecticide 7, which has been around a long time, formulation has changed a little, but that's okay, 7, 8, is a more recent one, like the letter 8, E-I-G-H-T. I am sure it's a play on the 7, you know, then 8. Um, I'm still waiting for 9 to come along, but that <laughs> one hasn't come yet. Uh, so 7 and 8, uh, both can be used maybe interchangeably, you know, one or the other uh, of the two. I, I've got 8 on the shelf right now. Okay, malathion is a good old standard one. Malathion has a fairly short waiting period, but by between the time you can apply it and the time it's safe to eat the produce. So, for example, on insects, on raspberries and things such as that, malathion is a good choice because uh, the label will indicate that it's safe to eat within a day or, you know, day, two days, whatever it recommends. Um, and another good one to have on hand is spinosad. Spinosad is an organic product, a wonderful history uh, on that, but uh, it's an organic product it is one of the few insecticides that is currently um, effective on Colorado potato beetles. Ooh. That has become resistant to almost all of the other insecticides, but spinosad, which is fairly new, is very effective. And plus it's organic. That's another good one to use on like raspberries if you're bothered with those little black beetles that are so annoying on those. And so we talked about seven or eight, one of those. Malathion is a good one. Spinosad. Um, and so those those are wonderful insecticides just to have on hand and readily available. Uh, if a person wants, instead of the synthetic insecticides, if you'd like an organic type approach, uh, neem oil or uh, insecticidal soap. Now, sometimes I ask, okay, insecticidal soap. Uh, I see recipes for Dawn dish soap in water. Can I use that? Well, the answer is no, because uh, Dawn dish soap is a degreaser and other dishwashing soaps, and plants have a natural waxy coating. And those degreaser type dishwashing liquids can break down um, adversely, break down the waxy coating on plants. So insecticidal soap was formatted so it's plant friendly. Okay. And also neem oil is another one that you see for an organic choice. It's more to understand, though, that those organic products, neem oil, insecticidal soap, have to contact the in insect itself. Okay. They don't leave a residue that if the insect eats it, it's going to die. Uh, so it has to actively coat that little insect for it to die. The other products, uh, 7, 8, uh, malathion, they have a residue on the leaf that then when the insect eats it, then the insect will die. Oftentimes, they also have some contact effect too. But, and of course, that's, sometimes that sounds alarming. Oh, it leaves a residue and I'm going to use that on vegetables. But no, these products have a specific breakdown period. Uh, the sunlight breaks it down. So the label will indicate a safe waiting period from the time if you use it on vegetables until it's time that's safe to eat because that product has broken down. But the advantage is they have a little bit of a residue then that it'll remain effective for a few days or maybe up to a week after you've applied it. So it continues to give protection against all these little things that seem to want to chew our flowers and vegetables. Well, hopefully people can get outside and still enjoy this great time of year and the bugs don't get them down. They can, they can take these steps to get their 
to, to get insects under control and get out and really enjoy your garden. Oh, and, uh, like I've mentioned before, in the each evening, and if you're ever driving by South Fargo, 27th Street South and 64th Avenue, swing by in front of the house, uh, stop and chat if you see me out in the front yard. Each evening, I just love, whether it's pulling weeds or just looking at things, watering, man, I'm I'm just soaking it all in. Uh, this time of year is just, I, I love it. I, I'm sure you feel the same way with your lawn and garden and and vegetables. It's great. It's great after the, the, we get late afternoon sun, but after that goes behind the garage, we get a little bit of shade and this area that we're setting up to be kind of our, our relax area with the clover lawn. Uh, yeah, things are coming together, but yeah, it is so nice in the morning. Now I'm, I've got myself into the habit of getting up earlier, going out, doing a little bit of weeding, doing my watering then. So it's nice. Those to are have two those. key times. Isn't it fun when the sun's kind of coming up and uh, early morning and then you're out working on the these things and or in the evening those are the two key times the, even just light the light and the atmosphere are, are amazing those two times of the day well that's gonna do it for another episode of growing together don if people have questions what's the best way to reach you yeah give me an email send me a photo if you like of, of any issues that you have or even send me successes that you have yeah too i love hearing about those or suggestions for the show uh, yes definitely Donald Kinsler spelled K-I-N-Z-L-E-R, at N-D-S-U dot E-D-U. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week. We'll see you next week. And have a great week, everyone. Growing Together, a gardening podcast, is sponsored by Bloomfield Garden Center, a family-owned retail greenhouse providing locally grown plants since 1974. You can find them one mile north of Sabin, Minnesota, or six miles south of I-94 at exit 6. Just a quick drive from Fargo-Moorhead.